to the importance of the infant baptism, but at the same time also, it destroyed the plan of salvation. Jesus is out of the picture, but the human is the center of the picture. Because if the sin is in you, your flesh, your nature is sin in itself, then you need to fight against yourself. And then we see how develop also the self-punishment, the pilgrimage, everything, the salvation is concentrated in the works. That is how develop the doctrine of the original sin. So you need to perform your salvation because the sin is in your flesh and you need to fight against your flesh. And this is the reason why after in the Reformation, the main principle of Luther was the justification by faith. You are a sinner, but you receive redemption by Jesus Christ, not by punishing your own body, not by destroying your life. You can be saved. Okay? So this uh, important doctrine, through his development, destroy the main foundation of Christianity. Jesus as the middle point of the salvation. Then, because you are so sinner that you cannot go to Jesus, you cannot go to him. So you need the priest. You need to confess to sin to the priest. The priest is the one that is holier than you. He will be represented you because you cannot. So Jesus is completely separated to the humanity in the development of this doctrine. Therefore, it's very, very important to understand the beginning of it and also the ramifications and the branches that we develop because of this. Now, <clears throat> you have here uh, the major cities from the Western Empire and the Eastern Empire. Um, we will mention, as I have told to you, some events from the Eastern Empire, but we will concentrate ourselves in the Western Empire, especially because the development of Christianity, as we know, is more uh, focused in this area of the European continent in North of Africa. So when the division came, between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church uh, respected also the border of the Eastern and the Western Empire. So we will see that all these sections become or Catholic and all these sections become Orthodox. We will see that the Orthodox work also in this area and until here they become also Orthodox Church and all the area of Russia too. After, when missionaries from the Eastern Empire were sent. The first empire that fall was also the Western Empire. Approximately one more uh, thousand years exists the Eastern Empire with Constantinople as a center of culture and religion and also political power. Rome become a spiritual center, a religious center, but no more was the capital of the Western Empire when this fall. Now, let us consider the precursors to the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, we know the trumpets, we know the Visigoths, we find the Vandals, the Huns, and um, we know the fall of the Western Rome. Um, these attacks constantly, um, considering the um, problems inside of the Western Imperium, we see, we find some aspects that also attack the Eastern part of the empire especially this section, but generally was concentrated in the western part of the empire. The borders were very strong in this area of the eastern empire. Therefore, only some of the barbarians 
uh, was able to come in and to attack in two main occasions Constantinople. But generally, they concentrated in the areas of the border of the Western Empire, especially because of the weak of the military power in this area. So we find exactly here the border, especially until this section here is the eastern part of the Roman Empire. So we find the attacks of the Visigoths. We see here that they began through the Eastern Empire, and from there they developed more in the Eastern, but others also came until Rome, and they attacked Rome. Um, then we have, we have three main attacks for the Visigoths, exactly in this period of time, 357 to 382, then 395 to 410, 412 to 418. But then we have the Vandals, also two main attacks in this section also, that went until North Africa, from 406 to 411, and from 429 to 439, and then we have from the Huns, 370 to 451. Especially um, the attack of Rome was very important, and uh, ex uh, especially with um, Alaric until the end of the territory of Italy was also covered. Um, these three main tribes, according to the trumpets, inflict um, and, and break the borders of the Roman Empire. Um, the refusal of the Roman government to grant land to the barbarians, as they have done in the past century, um, provoke the reaction of the attack in a front uh, power to the Western branch of the Western Empire. And one after the other, considering the confusion, disorder, immorality, and lack of organization of the western part of the Roman Empire gave the possibility to these barbarian tribes to attack the main post of the western Roman Empire. So the main period of the Germanic invasions are from 378 to 439, as I have say, I repeated, you can find some variation of the dates for a couple of years in different historians, but this don't change the fact that the fall of the Western Roman Empire happened in the fifth century. And in this way began also a new period and completely new understanding of the empire. Yes, brother. Mm -hmm. 1,000 no, um, 1, years after. Oh, 1,000 years after, okay. Yes. This Eastern Empire was, was mostly the Orthodox Church. I, I understood that the Pope uh, had complete power over the whole world, so did the Pope have control over the Eastern Empire when he was in power from 538 onwards? Or? Uh, one of the reasons of this division is the power of the Bishop of Rome. And we have considered, if you remember, in the past centuries, the tension between the East and the West. And always the main reason was the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome, related especially with doctrinal matters that he wanted to impose to all Christianity. And especially from the Eastern section, the bishops were not willing to accept it. And this brought a lot of tension. In two main cases, we find that they submitted to the Bishop of Rome. But after we will see that the iconoclast movement was a break in this relationship. And finally, they rejected the authority of the papacy. And the, the, the division remained until now. Yeah. Because the Greek Orthodox Church is submitted to the Pope of Rome, they recognize him. This happened approximately 30 years ago. 
also the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, also the Romanian Orthodox Church, but until now, the Russian Orthodox Church is not submitted to the papacy, until now. They have diplomatical relationship. The patriarch of the Orthodox Church visit the Pope in Rome, but they don't submit until now because they, they don't have popes, they have patriarchs, but correspond to the Pope that we have in, in Rome. When the Greek Orthodox patriarch came, he kneeled down before the Pope. And then the Pope took him, embraced him, and said, okay, the last son came again to the right path. Embrace him, and in this moment, the Greek Orthodox Church was also part of this universal church. They don't change the liturgy. When you go to an Orthodox Church, did you ever went to one? No? Okay. The Orthodox Church is a completely different from a Catholic Church. Okay? You don't find any statues. You don't find any sculptures. No one. It's not seats. You cannot sit by the worship. It's not allowed. When you go to an Orthodox Church, you need to stand all the time. Okay? The worship is singing all the time. Yeah? They don't speak. It's somehow speaking, but always like with a music behind it. And you have only icons. We don't have, you don't find a sculpture, which is the difference between an icon and a statue. It's only the drawing. It's drawings, but not the sculpture, not volume. Okay? It's on the floor, uh, on the walls, all the floors. The walls are painted, but you don't find any sculpture. This is one of the main differences in the liturgy, okay? And they make until now in Greek language. Yeah, we will see when Latin was um, introduced in the liturgy of the Western part of Europe, but they remain with the Greek traditional. And until now, they present all the liturgy in Greek language. Yeah. In Bulgaria, when you go to one of them, they don't have also natural light, they have only candles. So generally it's very dark to come in an Orthodox church. It's very dark. I, I visit one here in Atlanta, an Orthodox church, but have nothing to do with the reality. It's American version of the Orthodox religion, but when you go to Romania, when you go to Bulgaria, when you go to Russia, you find the true Orthodox churches. And they are very, very dark because there are only candles. You cannot come as a woman without covering. Okay, you need to cover yourself. No, los hombres no. Not the men, but the women, all of them. Especially if you go to Romania, even to our church, you see all the old uh, sisters with uh, something covering her head. Because generally they came from the Orthodox Church and this is the tradition that you need to cover yourselves for reverence, okay? So you see this uh, very clear, but very emphatic uh, characteristics. No, they have deacons, yes, yes. No, lo que yo he dicho es que ellos eh, usan las velas, no tienen luz natural, no hay asientos, tú tienes que estar de pie todo el tiempo. Las misas son todas misas cantadas, no habladas, y son en griego. Yeah. So, we didn't achieve this time now for the separation, the completely separation, but we have considered different moments of tension in this century also, different time of uh, periods of tension will come. Now, when we realize that the barbarians uh, attack the western part of uh, the Roman Empire, and in 410, Anna Alaric, king of the Visigoths, uh, even came as a surprise attack against Rome, uh, and everyone believed that Rome is in, 
invincible power, so nobody is able to, to conquer it. But this heaven then um, officially, according to the historians, began the Dark Ages when Rome was overcome. Uh, with Attila the Hun, we find another perspective that is also uh, an another of the trumpets and was another attack toward Rome, especially because that was the symbol of the empire. And if you conquer Rome, you are the owner of everything. But this is very, very important, um, the attack of Attila, because um, the bishop of Rome was alone, was not political power. All of them flee from Rome. So remain only the bishop of Rome, and his name was Leo, Leon I. And he realized that Attila will come and will destroy Rome. So what he kept done is to ask for an interview with Attila. And when he was approaching Rome, the bishop of Rome came to Attila and asked for mercy and plead to him not to attack Rome. And his petition was granted. But uh, the bishop, uh, in order that Attila spare the city, he offered to him a large ransom. And then Attila accepted. And the tradition say that Attila saw behind uh, the bishop Leo, the apostle Peter and Paul. And because he was full of fear and respect, he took the ransom and departed and don't attack Rome. This is a very, very important moment in the development of the Bishop of Rome because he was the one in this moment that took the position of a political leader. He was the one that went to Attila and asked for mercy not to attack the city of Rome. And he was willing to do anything but that Attila don't destroy Rome. And he managed to do so. He paid a high um, sum of money and richness, but Rome was spared and was not destroyed. This is a very, very important moment for the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome. Because in all the Western Empire, he was the only one that was willing was able to uh, confront, not with a military defense, one of the more powerful tribes at this time, the Huns, but he even succeeded with it. He paid, but he saved the city. So in the mind of all people, the Bishop of Rome became also a political leader and representative of the city. And that was a very important moment. And that was in 452. Now, Leo, the Bishop of Leo, that lived uh, approximately between 391 to 461, he claimed the title of Pope officially the first time, and this is also very important, the name of this bishop you need to know, the events that surrounded his importance you need to know, and especially the relation with the Huns and Attila. So the bishop of Rome became a hero, became a defensor of the the main city that represents all the values of Christianity and civilization, because you know what barbarian mean, right? What mean the word barbarian? Barbarians mean bubble, bubbling. When the Romans and before the Greeks hear other people speak that we are not speaking Greek, for example, they say they are barbarians. 
what, what they speak is not a civilized language. With the Romans was added the element of the language, also the customs that were against the civilization. And then all the nations, all the peoples, all the tribes that were not like the Romans, shaped, could uh, cut the hair with this kind of dresses that they have. They, all of them were barbarians. They were not civilized people. Now, when the Bishop Leo confronted them and he succeeded to uh, spare the city of Rome, become a hero. And because of this, as a spiritual representative and as a political representative, Bishop Leo gave himself the title of Pope. Pope means in the Greek name father. Okay? So he became the father not only of the believers in Christianity, but all of them that wanted protection and wanted help. So the Bishop of Rome that declared him sin, the only Pope, the only father was the one to help those in need. And then is this moment when he also included in this claiming the title of father, not only for the western part of the empire, but also from the eastern part of the empire. So was not recognized and declared Pope because he proclaimed himself. We know that we will see heaven after. But that already the papacy were uh, going to um, be authority based on the line of the Apostle Peter as they explain it, began to be a thought that not only political leaders consider but also religious leaders, especially for his act of heroism that he showed toward the Huns. Now, the monks and the nuns, the monasticists, were especially supported by Bishop Leo. Um, especially he called them out of the monasteries, out of the isolation, to help him to rebuild Rome, especially the walls and the surrendered areas from the city of Rome. And they came and helped the Pope to um, reconst reconst to reconstruct, no, to restore, excuse me, to restore the old paths, the aqueducts, the bricks, the bridges and the different um, infrastructures that were almost in ruins for the different attacks of the barbarian tribes. And they came and helped. So in this way also the Bishop of Rome also encouraged the monks and the nuns and they received also a special appreciation from the general population because they helped them to live in a better condition. They rebuilt the aqueducts that allow the conduction of the water to the city of Rome. The communications become better because they helped in the restoration of the bridges and many other important infrastructures around Rome. Now, the end of the Western Empire was the last uh, attack that they received um, from the Vandals in 455. And then um, Pope Leo the same, the bishop, asked to, to please spare the city and try to persuade them. And fortunately, in this case, without success. And um, in 476, Odoacher also deposed the last of the Western Empire emperors. And in this way, officially, 476 came in the records of the history 
of the last emperor of the Western Empire. The city was, in, was destroyed. And uh, now in the next um, map, you will see that um, the borders of the Western Roman Empire were completely destroyed and occupied by the barbarian tribes. You see here that the borders of the Eastern Roman Empire were killed. Yes? This was the last attack from Odoacer, and he destroyed the city, and also the last emperor, that was a, a young boy, was deposed, and no more emperor was there. The city was destroyed, desolated, and therefore is the official date that marks not only the fall of Rome, but the completely Western Empire. Because the border was no more to be preserved, and even the political power was under the barbarian control, and the spiritual power, like the bishop of Rome was not able to um, stop the vandalization of the city. So you see here again the borders of the Eastern Roman Empire were kept, protected, but not the Western Empire was completely abolished and occupied and distributed among different barbarian tribes. Now, the monastic sins grow and grow even more, especially now that the people feel so insecure. The borders of the Western Roman Empire was a kind of um, assurance to the people toward the barbarian attacks. And they keep the civilization. But now that that was not in existence, um, um, the insecurity promote the monasticism. And especially Benedict, we have already mentioned, but Augustine also built one special order, the Augustinians. Do you remember which was the main characteristic of the Augustinians as an order we have mentioned? Study and contemplation. So they copy a lot of books, they comment a lot from the books of the Bible, obviously according to their own understanding, especially according to the doctrine of Augustine of Hippo. But now also Benedict was um, another personality that um, also came in importance and built also another line of monasteries. And uh, he emphasized especially the education. They um, especially um, were concentrated in teaching the people to write and to read and they try also the, to copy the old books from the Greeks and from the Romans to keep the culture, the knowledge, and the wisdom. So many of the political leaders that wanted to know something about the history, the, no, the, the knowledge that was preserved after this barbarian attack that destroyed everything because the gen generality of the barbarians were alliterated. So they didn't have any interest in writing or uh, reading, so they destroyed all the libraries and all the written documentation. Now uh, the Benedictines in the monastery 
um, concentrate especially in um, the art and the education. And they copy a lot of books from the Greeks, from the Romans, and also from the early fathers of the church in order to keep it. And many of the political leaders at this time asked to keep Benedictine's monks in their court in order to keep uh, knowledge about the past and to know how to deal with different elements. So they become a very influential um, group of monks, especially because somehow they um, store the information, the wisdom from all the past centuries through this copying of manuscript and educating people. Now, uh, one of the very important barbarian tribes, like the Franks, uh, uh, we know that we are Aryans originally, also the Burgunds were Aryans, and the, the Vandals also. So we know that through the Council of Nicaea, a very clear resolution was taken against Arianism. And these three tribes that were already Christians were also confronted from the other Christians that were not Arians. So the Bishop of Rome promote and influence other political powers in order to fight against the Arianism. And we know that a dynasty of the Merovingians from the Franks developed that after become also the Cal the, Gra the Great, that Carloman was one that wanted also to restore the lost uh, power of the Western Empire. And we know that um, the beginning of the conversion of one of the Nerovingians king ini initiated also a special period of prophetical time. Do you remember which one? Which prophetical period began before 538? Yeah, and began with which year? Yes, and what happened this year? Exactly, we are already in this point. Not yet, this will happen the next century. But exactly in this period of time that these Clodobeos were converted, that was from the line of the Merovingians. They were the tribe of the Franks that were converted first from barbarians to Arianism and then from Arianists to Catholic Christians. And this began a very special period of time that is also in the prophetical periods of time. Now, at the same time, not only the barbarian tribes or the continent were important to consider, but also the barbarian tribes outside of the continent, like, for example, in the Great Britain. If you remember, um, the Arians, especially the Alexandria school, sent the first missionaries to Christianize Great Britain. We have studied this. But um, now we find um, a new perspective of evangelization. And now Patrick, what after came St. Patrick, was sent to evangelize the Ireland. That was never part of the Roman Empire. But now the Christianity uh, become part of the belief. And this uh, Patrick was a Sabbath keeper. And we will study this further on in this century. And we will see that the Irish church, Christian church, were all Sabbatarian. All of them were keeping the Sabbath and following the Holy Scriptures principles as also the church in Scotland. But that was a time also 
that um, the Bishop of Rome tried to um, proselytize all other barbarian tribes that were not yet a Christianized. Now let us see how Sabbath uh, developed in this um, fifth um, century. Augustine, I have explained to you how important was his input, his influence in the doctrine and the development of the Catholic Church. And he wrote also about the Sabbath, especially because he came from North Africa and he knew about the Coptic uh, Christians that keep the Sabbath, also the Ethiopian Christians that keep the Sabbath. So he wrote, not Augustine himself, but somebody about him, Augustine, whose testimony is made the more impressive by his being a committed Sunday keeper, shows that the seven-day Sabbath was observed in his days in the greater part of the Christian world, not only North Africa, but generally in all the Christian world. Sabbath was still the keeping. But he was a Sunday keeper, Augustine himself. He was against completely the Sabbath because he believed that this is a Judaic characteristic of this religion and the Jews killed Jesus. So we need to depart from this kind of influence. Down even to the fifth century, the observance of the Jewish Sabbath was continuing in the Christian church. If you remember, they tried to keep both days, Sabbath and Sunday. They tried also to establish a fasting Sunday and a joyful Sunday in order to uh, reduce the importance of the Sabbath and the people focus more in the joyful day of Sunday. But in any way, Sabbath was keeping at this time also. In 411, uh, Mingana, leader of the Eastern Churches, appointed a metropolitan director for China. These churches were sanctified in the seventh day. We know that from the Eastern part of the empire, missionaries, Christian missionaries were sent to Central Asia and also to China, India. And we have written that prove that the Christians in China in this century we are keeping the Sabbath. Also when the Buddhists came to existence, also was a confrontation with the early Christians and the Buddhists originally kept the Sabbath and we have the writings that prove this. Also the Hinduists. So in Constantinople, the inhabitants of Constantinople and almost everyone came together on Saturday as the first day of the week. So we see that in Constantinople was a mixture between the first day and Saturday. World, in the world, we have already mentioned this from, then let us see Egypt. Although it is generally customary in Egypt, in various cities and villages whose inhabitants meet on Saturday evening to celebrate the Lord's Supper, by day do not fast. So Egypt, the Copts, don't accept the resolution of the Bishop of Rome that they need to fast on Sabbath. They don't accept it. If you remember the connection between Sabbath and Passover, also the Coptic religion don't accept it. So they still keep the Holy Supper and Sabbath. Pope Innocent, Pope Silver, Sylvester, commanded the first that the faithful fasted on Saturday and Pope Innocent he made it mandatory for all laws subjected him to churches so that Saturday was not pleasant day. Innocent consecrated the day Saturday at the post. Christian in the fifth century maintained the Jewish observance of Saturday until the fifth century. And we will see this, how came the moment of the uh, completely separation. In France, for example, in addition to evening and night worship, it's never like it during the day except Saturday, okay? Christians uh, around 420 worked on Sunday, even the most pious Christians. So Sunday was a working day also, still, beside the uh, law of Constantine, okay?
in Africa. Augustine identifies with regret that two churches in Africa, one observed the Saturday and the second in this day of fasting, and that was Egypt and Ethiopia. In Spain, Ambrose Holy the seventh, the seventh day as a Saturday. He had great influence in Spain where he also maintained a Saturday. So in Spain, also the Christians were keeping the Sabbath. Sidonius write about Theodorica, the king of the goats, is the fact that earlier in the Eastern world, Blessed Saturday and Saturday, Saturday, oh, Saturday and Sabbath, and Sunday, excuse me, it's a mistake, Saturday and Sunday, worship, while people in the West Saturday neglected, Apollinaris, Epistolae, Sidonai, okay? So uh, in the Eastern part of the empire, Sabbath, was more respected than in the western part of the Roman Empire. The Church of Scotland had a habit that dates from the early, the monastic Church of Ireland that observed Saturday and resting from all his work. Scotland and Ireland, we see here the continuity of the practice earlier. The monastic Church of Ireland, that the day of rest was maintaining on Saturday. You have always the references of this. In Scotland, Columban work, worked 34 years in Scotland before his death on Saturday 9 June, say to this book in Dimer Tobi, this day is a Saturday, a day of rest. And for me, it is a really a day of rest because they make an end of all my work and effort. Columban also was written about him. The writer of the best work of life, Columbus says, our Saturday, the custom of calling the first day of the week day of rest began only about a thousand years later in Ireland and also in Scotland. So during all the fifth century that the majority of the missionaries were sent to Scotland and Ireland, all of them bring the teaching of the Sabbath to the new converted. Do you find Columbus, Columbanus also in the great controversy? Yes. In which island he established a missionary school that the great controversy explains to us? The island of Iona. That is one island in the north part of Ireland. Okay. And from there, they sent also missionaries to different parts of Europe and also Africa and Asia. So now we see something um, very interesting. Uh, the eastern part of the empire remained without the influence of the Aryan. So Aryanism was not an issue in the eastern part of the empire. The most problem of the Aryan tribes were in the western part of it. And that was all the area that covered these three main tribes. And in which year these three tribes were conquered. It's also a prophecy for it. Okay, this you need to know. Which prophecy mentioned that three horns were taken out and the one horn became even bigger and bigger? It's a prophecy for it. It's, it's already for these three main tribes that become Aryans and were overcome. Yes, in Daniel 7 you find it. But in which year this happened? We have mentioned already in other lessons, so you need to go through. So the Vandals, the Visigoths, and the Ostrogothic kingdoms were all Aryans. And having been converted to Christianity during the 330s, the 40s, and the 50s, and um, after the decision of the Council of Nicaea, no big changes happen. 
So it was needed to establish a very clear uh, fight against them. But with the conversion of Clovis, king of the Franks, uh, began this process of uh, improvement. And finally, in 589, was the last tribe converted, and he rejected Arianism, and that was the Visigothic Hispanic king. And then the king Recaret, uh, bringing an end to Arianism as a state religion. Now, we are going to another aspect now. It's related with the consuls that happened, especially the last two ones in this fifth century. But we cannot consider the last two without considering the first two that we already mentioned. So if we remember, these four concepts are very, very important and you need to know. The dates, the name, and the issues or the problems that they deal with. So we have already mentioned Isaiah 325, that the solution and the, 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 the practice of the resolution came in conclusion until the sixth century. So the resolution was there, but was a theoretic, theoretical one, because three of the main powerful barbarian tribes were Aryans. So until the sixth century, we don't see the fulfillment of this resolution. So the main problem was the Arianism. Then, 381, that was Constantinople. And they deal with the Apollinarians. Apollinarians. The Apollinarians divided human and divine, divine parts of Jesus. And that was, um, not exactly a modification of Arianism, but in, in some way was because was dealing also with the nature of Jesus, but they never denied the divine human nature of Jesus. They only make a difference between a completely different human nature and a completely divine. They were not combined. They were completely divided. Um, the followers of Arian also say it in this time together with the Apollinarians that the Holy Spirit was also not fully God. If the Arianists mentioned that Jesus was not fully God, was created, now also in this point the subject about the Holy Spirit came in question and declared that it's a divine messenger is a power, it's like an energy coming from the Father, but is not uh, independent with own personality and activities. It's a messenger, and therefore it's not fully God. It's an extension of it. But then we go to these two main elements in the fifth century, and this is the, co the Council of Ephesus in 431. And this um, deal with another point that was introduced, and that is the Nestorians. They came from Nestor. The Nestorians believe that um, Jesus was human because was born from a woman. But we cannot say that this woman is, is the mother of God but is the mother of Christ. And we know that in this time, if you remember, at the end of the fourth century, there was already this tendency to venerate the Virgin Mary because she was the mother of Jesus. Okay? And the incarnation was a divine act. And even if Mary was a human being, he was a special human being and therefore cannot be considered as a regular, common human being. 
and especially because she gave birth to Christ, he became from another nature. So he became a special nature. And the Nestorians reacted against this tendency of the veneration of the Virgin Mary only because she gave birth to Jesus. So the Nestorian says that we have to say, okay, Mary is respected as a person, but is a person. It's a human being. Not because she gave birth to Jesus become from another nature and was superior or any other human being. So they say he is the mother of Christ. You can never say she is the mother of God because the tendency was already in this direction. If we remember that what we have considered in the fourth century. So the Nestorians reacted against this. And this was a movement in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. And the Nestorians were rejected and they say in this council, in the Council of Ephesus, that Mary is the mother of God. It's not the mother of Christ. It's the mother of God. And we know that the Nestorians were persecuted in the Eastern Empire and that they also developed until Central Asia because of the persecution in the borders, until the borders of the Eastern Empire. Now we have another element that was included and therefore another council was called and that was the Chalcedon in 451 and deal also with another element that was the monophysites. The monophysites again deal with the nature of Jesus and again this subject can become important. Um, they believe that Jesus was both with the human nature and with the divine nature. Uh, but they believe also that had only one nature and his divinity totally replaced his human nature. So that was a very uh, tricky explanation from the Docetists. The Docetists say clearly, so Jesus never, never was human. He was always divine. He only took appearance, external expression of humanity in order to approach humanity. Now, the monophysists say that it's only one nature that Jesus had. Jesus didn't have a double nature, divine and human, no. He had only one nature because Jesus is divine, but he combined also human nature, but his true nature was the divine one. So it's a variation of the Docetists. They don't went so much in the detail it was only external or was only in appearance, but they remain with the idea it's only one nature. This is what means mono. Mono is one in Greek. So only one nature, this nature is divine, and the human nature was like a subordinated in nature, but never become the really original and true nature of Jesus. So we see that during all these main concepts, one element that always remained as, as a continuation of problem was the nature of Christ. After was added the problem of the nature of the Holy Spirit, also in the Constantinople, the first concept in 381, but this element from uh, the Council of Ephesus is very important in 431 that deal with the problem that was introducing the Virgin Mary as a, a personality that was worthy to be worshipped, not, excuse me, not worshipped, to venerate, the worship came after, a couple of centuries after, but at least to consider that is the mother of God. In the moment that the mother, that she is the mother of a God, she cannot be only human. And that was what will come in the sixth century also, to elevate her above the human. And the next level will be 
not only about human, but equal with divinity. So that was step by step formation of the doctrine. Yes? So in most cases, they made the right decision, but in 432 in Ephesus, they made the wrong decision. Yes. So in other three councils, they made the right decision. Yes. But, and this is very important, uh, I am thankful that you notice this, because especially in this period is the period of the deepest of apostasy also. We have seen how different heresies, different um, paganism ideas and beliefs were introduced in Christianity. But in this moment, a resolution was taken that to persecute those that say that Mary was the mother of Christ because they needed to say it is the mother of a God. Okay? So we see this is the, the point why we introduce always a summary of the main consuls because through the consuls you can see how the truth was uh, compromised in order to accommodate the different um, female goodness, goodness that needed to be introduced because of the acceptance of paganism inside of Christianity. Um, the point of the Nestorians is very important and I wish to emphasize uh, a little bit because um, um, Nestorians uh, was a patriarch of Constantinople. So he was a very important bishop, was the bishop of Constantinople. So Nestorius was not somebody, uh, a common bishop or an elder, but he was a very important of um, leader, religious leader in the eastern part of the empire. So he was the patriarch of Constantinople. And he, was the one um, uh, provoking the reaction to make a difference between the um, Mary as the mother of Christ and the rejection of Mary of the mother of God. And he even um, established a school, the school of Edessa. This is in the north part of Turkey, more near to the border with Ukraine near to the Black Sea. And um, this school um, came to the point after the formulation of this resolution in the Ephesus Council that the Nestorians break with the Imperial Church. And this is the first official organization that rejected doctrines of the official church. And one of the main divisions, we will see other divisions that came. But this point was um, very important. So this council you need to remember very well. And also the school of Edessa and the break of the Nestorians with the imperial church from the eastern part. Nestorians don't have a lot of influence in the western part of the empire. But we will see that because of the result of the school of Edessa, also they influences different uh, movement in the western part of the empire that also break with the imperial church in the western empire. So this is a very special and very interesting century because it's when we find officially a dissident groups that rejected the resolutions of the imperial church from the East Empire or from the fully Western Roman Empire. Therefore, uh, we will go on with this element, especially uh, putting together the East and the Western part of the Christianity. So may the Lord help us to understand this and to follow these principles. Now, the homework. The homework for this uh, time will be to find out in the great controversy the activities of Columbanus. 
You need to find this in the great controversy because we have mentioned already what kind of activities, why they develop these activities, and um, you need to write down like a short essay, at least one and a half page, about Columbanos. If you don't, in the great controversy is not much information, it's mentioned some things, but then you go, you need to go to internet, to encyclopedias, and look even more for Columbanos, because it's a very, very important element related with the dissident groups in the fifth century and the reaction against the imperial church in the western part of Europe. Is clear the homework? Um, yeah, I was going to say, you said um, find the activities of Columbus, and what else did you say to find out about him? Okay, you need to find who he was, where he worked, what, what kind of activities he developed, and how his influence in the school that he founded influence also Europe and the Imperial Church and form the first official, not the first, but one of the dissident groups organizatorial in the, against the Imperial Church. Will be not enough the information in the great controversy. Therefore, I mentioned you need to go to internet, to encyclopedias, and found more about Columbanus. And at least you need to write the form of an essay, one and a half page about him. A short biography, activities, main doctrines, and influence outside of his own working area. Okay? Just one more thing. Maybe the way we could um, have this one be due by Friday at 3 o'clock because we have a test for uh, Revelation tomorrow um, with Brother Watts and we may not have time. Well, it might be difficult. Yeah, nothing is impossible for those that want to do it. Okay, so unfortunately I need to give you this work and it's not complicated, I can assure you. If you are concentrated, for the great controversy you find very easy what is there. Then you go to internet or encyclopedia and you will find and you put this together to formulate it in this thing. Brief biography, mission, activities, and influence out of, outside of his own territory. And this is done in one and a half hour work. So it's not something uh, out of order. It's not 13 pages to write down. One and a half page. It has to be one and a half page? Yes, at least. Yes. If you write more, I will not uh, be against it. But at least this you need to write down. Single space. <laughs> yes. Brothers, don't try to do the less that you can. Do the best that you can. And if this is the most, this is even best for you. So this will not damage you, not even hurt you. Even the opposite will happen to you this. So let us close with a voluntary prayer, please.